Hi, welcome to the Quipster Film Review Podcast. My name is Vince Leo. I am the film critic for the website Quipster.net. I invite you to check out over 3,800 film reviews you can read anytime at my website, Quipster.net. That's Q-W-I-P-S-T-E-R.net. Today I'm going to be looking at a film that was originally slated to go straight to DVD, Blu-ray, as well as to streaming services. As with many other DC Animated Universe films, the anticipation of this film kind of ratcheted up the interest, and so Warner Brothers decided to release it for one day in theaters on Monday, July 25th in the United States and other times around the world. And then it would be released on streaming services like iTunes around the same day and other streaming services the next day, July 26th. And then on August 2nd, it would be released on DVD and Blu-ray. So if you don't have this playing in your town or you can't get out to the movie theater on a Monday night, just know that you'll be able to watch it on iTunes or other streaming services either concurrently or the day after. And you can just wait till Blu-ray or DVD if you want to own it. The movie that I'm talking about is called Batman the Killing Joke that definitely will ring a certain air of familiarity for those people who've been longtime comic book fans. It's definitely a seminal work in the world of comic books. This one's an animated feature. It is an action adventure thriller. It has a lot of film noir elements to it as well. Uh, the other notable thing about this release is that it is the first DC animated universe film that is going to get an R rating by the MPAA. There are some bloody images and some disturbing content within the course of this film. It's a short movie. It's about an hour and 16 minutes, which is in line with the rest of the DC animated universe features. The cast includes some heavyweights. If you've been following DC animated shows, Batman the Animated Series, you'll recognize Kevin Conroy is back as Batman. Mark Hamill is back as the Joker. So, you know, basically the voices that a lot of people feel are synonymous with those characters in animated form. Tara Strong, veteran vocal talent is here. She's playing Batgirl. Maury Sterling and Ray Wise also get supporting vocal roles. The director is Sam Liu. And the screenplay is by Brian Azzarello. This is, of course, based on the graphic novel by Alan Moore and Brian Boland. That work is a heavily revered graphic novel. It's back in the time of its release. It won an Eisner Award. It was released, originally published back in 1988 and has been a hot seller. It made the New York Times bestseller list at the time. And it's still one of their best-selling graphic novels even to this day. It was a one-shot that detailed the dark and twisted origin of Batman's main nemesis, the Joker, and really brought that character up to speed, making him a much darker and more sinister character that has really continued to be the main way that the Joker is portrayed all the way to this day. As with other DC Animated Universe releases, this one is not aiming at kids, so I think that parents should really take note. This is an R-rated film, as I mentioned all of the rest of the titles have been PG-13, so this is even stronger than those animated features that are still a little bit too strong for most kids. Along these lines, I will say, even though it is an R-rated film, they didn't really go all out. They did not put pedal to the metal to make the most bold R-rated feature out there. This really skirts the line. If this were actually to get a PG-13 release, I would not have been completely surprised, even though I feel like some of the subject is a bit touchy. I don't even think it's as adult as, say, the original comic, but there is an implication here of rape of one of the characters in the story, and I think that that alone is enough to push it over the line to being something that the MPA would feel a little bit nervous about children watching, even if the way that it's framed within the course of this movie, that children that may be too young, say 9, 10, 11 year olds that may have actually gone out and watched this movie, probably they probably won't really understand this aspect of this movie. This sexual assault is never shown. The word rape is not even mentioned in the film. So it's really by implication. You really have to be paying attention and to have the life experience to know what actually is going on. The Killing Joke is a bit off kilter as far as Batman stories go. Not every Bat fan will be in tune with it, especially those who are not used to the mature way that it tells its tale. It's very mature audience oriented. The inclusion of an implied sex scene and also a rape scene, notice that I did not include them as the same thing in this film, 
they may be just implied, but I don't think that most people are used to seeing this from an animated feature. In this outing, Batman has some introductory scenes in which he battles some bad guys with the help of Barbara Gordon as Batgirl, and then he eventually goes on to confront the Joker at Arkham Asylum, only to discover that the Joker has made his escape and is out and about causing havoc around Gotham City. The Joker has an agenda. He's out to prove that anyone can go as mad as he has if given the right, or I should say wrong, circumstances. All it takes is one bad day, so he says. So he sets about committing some pretty heinous acts towards some of the people who are fighting on the side of good to make his point. And in between these scenes that is set in the more contemporary timeline, we get flashbacks to Joker's past, kind of an origin story for him as a failing comedian who ended up turning to a life of crime in order to support his wife and his yet-to-be-born child. Circumstances ended up resulting in tragedy that eventually cracks the Joker's psyche as he physically transforms his appearance to look as maniacal on the outside as he feels on the inside. So on board for the vocal talent here is the most defining versions of Batman and the Joker, as I mentioned, Kevin Conroy and Mark Hamill, respectively. It should be noted here, if you tend to follow such things, Mark Hamill in 2015 said he was going to retire from voicing the Joker because there was a lot of strain on his vocal cords in trying to give Joker that really raspy sound, very iconic and, you know, unrecognizable as Mark Hamill generally. But he did say that he would return if he were able to voice the Joker in an adaptation of The Killing Joke. So here we have him back from retirement after just a year. After his experience in voicing The Killing Joke, he has since reconsidered his retirement and is going to be doing a little bit more vocal talent for Joker in the future. The animation for this film is pretty much in tune with the rest of the DC Animated Universe features. You know, if you're expecting big cinema, you know, this was not intended to be going to big screen, so... It pretty much was supposed to be a straight-to-Blu-ray streaming services type of film. So, you know, they really didn't put a big budget onto this film to make it more cinematic. So, you know, expect that. Most of the animation is done by Japanese Animation Studio with others in Hong Kong and Korea and Australia. It's really interesting the way that they developed this film, kind of in keeping with the way that Alan Moore tended to do his comic book work. There's a lot of matching shots to transition between the scenes. I think those are phenomenal for this kind of movie. It's definitely well worth watching for those viewers who appreciate the time that it takes to put together a story through these kinds of visual cues in which the last shot of one scene tends to match up either thematically or visually with the first shot of the next scene. I think one thing that's missing from The Killing Joke is... An emotional payoff for some of the character arcs that occur within the course of this film. This is a self-contained story. It's one that is basically out of the current continuity. I think the only connection that we have with the main characters going into this film is that is if you have a fondness for them and their history in comic books or other mediums going into it. So you bring that baggage with you going into this film. If you haven't been a Batman fan, if you don't even know who Batgirl is, I don't think you're going to have any emotional impact to what's going on. So if a character is going to get brutally assaulted or tortured or killed, we just don't have the time within the course of an 80-minute movie that covers so much ground to actually feel the weight of the horror of these developments and what they imply, especially since what happens within the course of this movie may not necessarily carry over into a permanent ongoing series. Although, if you stick around to the end credits, there is an extra scene that basically implies that there's going to be a continuation of this story in some form or fashion. Whether it does or not, I don't know, but the implication is there. Now, if you're a big fan of the original Alan Moore work from 1988, I think that you stand to be the most disappointed in the way this film tells its story. It definitely deviates from the original story in some very significant ways. Some of them you may not feel are for the better. The most significant one is having an introductory story, kind of a prologue, very prolonged prologue, I should say, that goes on for 15 or 20 minutes in which Batman and Batgirl attempt to take down a loony mob boss. This is all created for this film. Not It does not appear in the original print counterpart. It's not a bad story element on its own, but at the same time, it doesn't really fit in thematically with the rest of the story. It takes away what I feel to be precious time that could have gone to bolstering the main story that is to come and for which most people are probably going to view this. 
Obviously, the attempt is here to shore up sympathy for these characters before tragedy strikes for them. So it doesn't really quite achieve that sympathy. We don't really have an adequate backstory to care for Batman or Batgirl beyond their costumed personas. So we don't really feel the ultimate blow. It's nice that they tried, but it doesn't really work out. Also, while this is an R-rated film, it does seem likely that the makers of this animated version of The Killing Joke were trying their best to get the material down to a PG-13 level if necessary, even though Warner Brothers gave their blessing to go ahead and make it R-rated. Some of the strongest elements of the print counterpart is somewhat watered down here to sand off a lot of the edge and still try to keep the gravity of the situations intact. So know this, it's an R-rated film, but it could have been a PG-13 film with just a few seconds snipped away from it here and there. Outside of this, you know, knowing that it's not a 100% faithful adaptation of the Alan Moore work, Uh, And I should note here, Alan Moore does not get a credit for his work on the original material. In fact, the credit actually goes to Brian Bolin. Alan Moore wants his name removed pretty much from any film, and certainly uh, that carries here too. So you won't see Alan Moore's name as a credit, generally speaking, for even films that are directly adapting his work as this one does. If you've never read the original Alan Moore work, or if you don't really revere it as much as many other comic book readers have over many years, even if you do revere it, if you're not expecting a wholly faithful adaptation, if you go into this just comparing it to the rest of the DC animated original movie universe films, I think that you will have to agree this is still a top shelf film for the DC animated universe. And I do think taken on those terms, it is definitely recommended for all fans of the Batman animated features over the last several years. So I'm going to give Batman The Killing Joke three and a half stars out of four. And three and a half stars on my scale means that I think it is a good movie if taken on its own terms. Maybe it's not the best adaptation of The Killing Joke. You know, people were anticipating that becoming a live action film, you know, on the big screen. You know, certainly that still may happen at some point, but Taken for what it is as a one and done type thing, even though it may not necessarily live up to the original material, this is still a good film, I think, and one of the best DC animated universe films I have seen. So Batman the Killing Joke gets a recommendation from me for Batman fans. Thank you, everyone, for listening. I hope you enjoyed this review. If you did, I do encourage you to click the subscribe button and you'll continue to get all of my podcasts downloaded. I cover not just comic book films, so just know that I do... Most of the films that are out in theaters and wide release, a lot of independent films and ones that go straight to VOD as well. So I run the gamut of whatever's out there that I think that I personally would like to see and or that I think the audience for this podcast will want to hear about. If you are a longtime listener, go ahead and leave a review on iTunes and also go to patreon.com slash quipster if you want to donate and help out the show because this is a very costly show for me to produce. I don't get any money for it, but if you do want to help out, that that will only make the show better. Until next time, I hope that you enjoy your time anytime you get to go to the movies. And if you see Batman the Killing Joke, whether it's in the movie theater or at home or on your iPad, I hope that you have a really great time with it. 